on how to live better and which is why I'm excited to be here today. And um, I believe that the path to living well is through learning and the true learning often begins when we have uh, when we've completed our formal education. But the way we learn changes over time. And so it's important to know how our learning needs change and what trainers and course developers can do and to understand how adults can learn both for ourselves as well as for the people that we teach. Um, but enough about me, I'm sure you share my excitement for why we're here today, even though we might be attending for different reasons. And my friends, if you have returned after your previous experience of InnoVlog, thank you for coming back. I hope today's session will be equally insightful to you as well. But if you're new to InnoVlog, um, this is a program set out to breach research and practice in adult learning and workforce development. Um, the idea is for you to achieve better outcomes in policy development and professional practice in these areas. And the InnoVlog sessions are organized as two hour seminars with panel led dialogues. And today's session is about lifelong learning. Lifelong learning is increasingly being embraced as a key to living productive and fulfilling lives, even into old age. And um, neuroplasticity is essential to our ability to learn. Neuroplasticity is the ability for the brain to stay sufficiently malleable to reorganize its neural networks when exposed to new experiences and new environments. And so the question is, how do we maintain neuroplasticity and slow down deterioration of our intellectual faculties as we age? And further to that, we also explore how learning designers can harness these insights to improve learning outcomes. And today we have three speakers. Our first speaker today is Professor Annabelle Chen. She is the Professor of Psychology at the College of Humanities, Arts and Social Sciences at Nanyang Technological University with joint appointments at LKC Medicine and the National Institute of Education. She is also director at Cradle at NTU, which is the Center for Research and Le Development in Learning. Prof Annabelle is a clinical neuropsychologist and has worked with adults and children. Her lab uses neuropsychological and neuroimaging methods to understand the brain and behavior. Her areas of investigation include higher cognition in the cerebellum, aging neuroscience for active aging, and neuroscience of learning and education for developing evidence-based interventions. She contributes to the science of learning research at Cradle, where innovative interdisciplinary research from education, psychology, neuroscience, and technology is used to examine learning that can inform practices in workforce and lifelong learning. Um, Prof Annabelle, thank you for joining today. Um, where are you? Could you just give a wave to the audience and say hi for, for them to see where you are at on their screen? Can you see me over here? Right, I think, I believe I can. And so does everyone else. Thank you for joining us today. I look forward to hearing the insights from your research. And um, moving on to our second speaker, Ms. Florence Yuan is the Senior Business Growth Consultant at Rice Consultancy. And she brings with her 30 years of experience from the fields of service excellence management, operation excellence management, and workforce development. With her experience and desire to groom workplace talents in the company, she has facilitated many learning sessions in the last 10 years as an adult educator. Um, Florence lives by the motto, living is learning and sharing, and learning and sharing is living. And um, Florence, thank you for joining us today. Where are you? Could you say hi to our audience to identify hi, you? Good to see you, everyone, and uh, very happy to be here. That sounds good. I'm glad, glad to have you here with us. Um, I'm sure your experience in training, design, and delivery will be treasured by our participants today. Um, and our third speaker, Ms. Carolyn Ng, is the Executive Director for the Good Life Family Club, a senior activity center. She is also the Vice President of Manfut Tong Welfare Society, a non-profit organization. Currently, Carolyn is undertaking the graduate diploma in social work with SUSS after having completed the Masters of Arts in Professional Education with NTU NIE. And among her other roles, she is also an associate lecturer with MDIS School of Fashion Design and conducts trainings for the Center for Seniors in programs such as life work and intergenerational bonding. 
As an actor, trainer, and certified career development facilitator, Carolyn's core belief is in constantly upskilling and in connecting people as the new dynamics of organization growth. Um, thank you for joining us today, Carolyn. Um, I'm looking forward to learning about your experience with adult and mature learners later today. Um, before we dive into the sharing by each of the speakers, I'd just like to share three points with everyone. Number one, please note that this session is being recorded. You can visit the website to review the recordings after this session. And number two, there will not be any official breaks during the session. So please feel free to take your own breaks if you need to make coffee or to visit the washroom. Please go ahead as you please. And number three, I'd like to share the flow of this session. So after each speaker, there will be a short three minute Q&A session in which I will present the submitted questions to the speakers. So if you have any questions, please submit them via the Zoom Q&A feature. You'll be able to see the questions posed by other participants as well. Um, please upvote the questions that you would like answered. Priority will be given to questions with the most votes. And after all three speakers have presented and had the individual Q&A session, we would have a group dialogue and Q&A session to address questions and ideas that have arised from the entire session across the three speakers. And that's it. That's it for the announcements. And I've spoken a lot right now. And now that most or everyone has settled down, let's begin. Um, first up, we'll have Prof Annabelle on helping the adult brain learn better for lifelong learning. Prof Annabelle, please. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. And are you seeing my screen? Yes, it's showing perfectly. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the kind introductions, Jun Han. A very good afternoon to all. Um, I'm very glad to be here today to share about some information we have learned about the adult brain from uh, neuropsychology and cognitive neuroscience. See if I can forward. Okay. As you know, um, in our lifetime, career trajectory is no longer the inverted U shape curve as depicted by this traditional employment model. Rather, our contribution to the workforce is becoming more and more convoluted with multiple transitions in and out employment and learning, as shown here. And the ability to learn, relearn, and unlearn in order to upskill and reskill is becoming the norm in our lifetime. So there is an emphasis for the need of lifelong learning, as Jun Han also mentioned earlier, as we age. So in today's talk, I would like to share with you what we know about our aging brain and how we can optimize it to help us embrace the culture of lifelong learning. I will share from some of my research on what changes in our brain as we age, whether we can help our aging adult brain to learn better and some insights from training our brain. So first let's look at what cognitive neuroscience research has found about our aging brain so far. Uh, we often complain that we are not as sharp or fast anymore as we get older. So what changes in our cognitive performance as we age? Is it all downhill? This figure shows the distribution of our cognitive performance across people from different age groups from 20s to 80s. The green and blue gray lines show decline in speed of processing, working memory and long-term memory as we age. This group of cognitive functions are also known as fluid intelligence. However, our world knowledge represented by the yellow, orange, and red lines is preserved, which may even show some improvement in the later years. These are known as crystallized intelligence. Another cognitive ability known as analytical thinking or problem solving, not shown here on the graph, actually has a slight inverted U shape across the lifespan. We tend to get better um, at that, especially when we re reach the middle to older uh, age. So we are no, while we are no longer fast and agile as we age, it is true that we do get older and wiser. Uh, how about our brain structure? What happens to it as we age? A study measuring brain volumes across time and various brain regions 
show reduction in volume with age in brain structures such as the caudate nucleus, which is involved in variety of cognitive and emotional functions and best known for the role in movement. The cerebellar hemispheres, our little brain down here, that is largely involved in both physical and cognitive coordination. The lateral prefrontal cortex, which are the sites of the frontal brain regions, um, are very heavily involved with the cognitive functions forming our fluid intelligence mentioned earlier, and our hippocampus, which is heavily involved in learning and memory. However, there are also some regions uh, in our brain with minimal reduction or stable volume as we age, such as our primary visual cortex at the back of our brain involved in vision uh, perception, as well as our entorhinal cortex, which is an important area that supports the hippocampus and is involved in learning, memory, navigation, and to some extent, emotions. How about brain function or activity that supports our cognitive performance? Non-invasive brain imaging like functional MRI also show that uh, we have age-related changes in our uh, activity in the brain. Here is the MRI scanner that we have decorated with a spaceship theme to scan children. So some studies from my research lab has shown that memory changes in older adults represented by decrease in activity in the hippocampal areas here, uh, uh, decreases as we age. And what is more interesting is that these regions in older brains tend to activate more with increase of repetition over time. Another area is language. Here we show that there's a shift in reading pathways accompanied by slower reaction time in older adults, suggesting a decline in efficiency of network connectivity. There are also age-related changes in the resting brain. Our brain actually continues to be active even when we are resting and not thinking about anything in particular. We can image the brain during this time and call it the brain in the default mode. We see that some networks in blue actually increase in functional activity, while others in red decrease in activity uh, connectivity as we age. In particular, we found that the influence of this so-called salience network to the right executive control network is greater for middle-aged adults compared to younger adults. These networks are thought to be involved in social emotional regulation, self-awareness and attentional control. This finding suggests that middle-aged adults may have better metacognitive control and regulation to execute ideas than younger adults. This could also explain the fact that at middle age, we tend to have better ability to see the bigger picture and make better decisions in complex situations. I've shared so far that our learning behavior is affected by brain function, structural connect, uh, cognition over the lifespan. One thing we cannot discount is the impact of environment and culture on our learning behavior as well. In fact, these three factors of environment, behavior, and brain interact together and shape our ability to learn. Research in neuroscience has shown that our brain can still be rewired as we age but at a slower rate shown here by the purple pathway. This is known as neuroplasticity, which refers to the long lasting changes in the brain makeup to support behavior. The decline in cognition is not uniform and we have quite a lot of room still to flex our brain muscles, so to speak, as we age. This is known as flexibility shown in this orange curve, uh, which is the capacity to optimize performance within the limits of our current functional supply or brain resources. This flexibility in behavior has been shown to peak into the early adulthood to middle age. So how can we promote neuroplasticity and flexible behavior to enhance learning? Here are some uh, examples. We can look at neurogenesis that is promoting growth of brain cells through strategy, um, uh, training and exercise and improving our sleep. Uh, to promote structural connectivity, we can do cognitive training or using non-invasive stimulation of our brain, which uh, we don't have the time to cover today. Uh, 
Another moderating factor to improve memory with age is functional engagement in terms of stress management and other lifestyle factors that I will touch upon next. So can we help the adult brain to learn better? <clears throat> yes, we can, but how much can we improve will depend on individual differences. One concept is this cognitive reserve. That is our ability to make flexible and efficient use of available brain reserve to optimize our performance in the face of decline due to aging. This is related to that flexibility um, capacity that I have shared earlier. Education or the time we spend learning is one of the most important factor. Our research has also shown that education is associated with greater brain activity and better performance, even in the face of loss in brain cells. So learning itself can help us to preserve our cognitive capacity. Other factors that contribute to this cognitive reserve includes our IQ level, literacy, occupational complexity, uh, participation in leisure activities, forming strong social networks, and even our personality. Lifestyle factors can also affect the state of our brains and impact the way we learn. So exercise here has shown to boost our brain power. Uh, when we exercise, uh, it gets the blood to our brain, bring glucose and energy to help uh, the detox process needed in our brains. It stimulates the protein, the BDNF, that keeps neurons connecting. In fact, our brains are built to walk 15 to 20 kilometers a day. So we need to be on the move to improve our thinking skills. Studies have also shown that uh, aerobic exercise two to three times a week can have our lifetime risk of general dementia. Another lifestyle factor is sleep. Yes, your mom is right. We need to sleep well to think well. When we sleep, neurons in our brain show rhythmical activity that are perhaps replaying what we have learned that day. Consolidation of memory takes place. So if we don't sleep, we are depriving the brain to form networks uh, to strengthen our memory on what we have learned. Loss of sleep hurts our cognitive function, especially fluid intelligence and even our motor dexterity. So um, we have to be careful with our sleep hygiene. A study has also shown that our brain health in the long run does not depend on how, we, how well we slept last night, but how well we have been sleeping in the last 20 years or so. So it is really important to start developing a good sleep hygiene as early as possible. Uh, stress management is also important. Some stress is good to keep things going, but chronic stress is actually dangerous. When we are stressed, our body reacts to it by releasing adrenaline and cortisol. Too much adrenaline creates scars in our blood vessels that are associated with heart attacks and strokes. High levels of cortisol damages cells in our hippocampus and can stall our ability to learn and remember. So exercise again can help manage stress by storing up our BDNF, which is needed to keep the peace in our brain. Uh, and also exercise increases the chemical in our brain called dopamine, which helps to put us in a good mood and increase our capacity for joy. Now, although memory decline as we age, there are ways we can boost it to help with learning. For short-term memory in learning new things, the more elaborate the way we encode it, using different ways when it is new, the stronger it will be. Using sensory integration also helps uh, in encoding the information. Thus, we can teach the same material in different modality, for example, repeat the information using visual or auditory material, even through drawing and uh, actions. To remember it longer, we need to learn it over time gradually and repeat it in timed intervals called uh, paced learning. And reproducing the environment that you first learned something could also improve your chances in remembering it. 
Earlier, I've also shared our research showing that repetition of information helps to activate the hippocampus, that is the brain structure, very important for memory and older brains. So repeat to remember and remember to repeat. Lastly, to improve learning, we need to be and stay curious. Since childhood, uh, we are natural explorers, always asking why. And that's why we have all those books about a hundred whys for the toddlers. We learn um, by active testing through observation, hypothesis, and experiment to reach conclusions. Therefore, active engagement is uh, pretty important for learning. Self-correction also helps us to learn. Our right prefrontal cortex is wired to be sensitive in detecting areas around us, and the nearby networks help to correct it. In fact, one of our former NIE colleagues developed this theory of productive failure. He found that students learned uh, math problem solving uh, better through the mistakes they make. Therefore, don't be afraid to make mistakes. You can actually learn from them. We tend to learn better through imitation as we have these so-called mirror neurons in our brains that are good at imitating actions. Therefore, demonstration of concepts through action is also helpful to learn better. So be, be and stay curious to remain lifelong learners. Lastly, can we train our brain to improve cognition? There are quite a lot of uh, cognitive and physical training programs out there. Do they really work? This will depend on what they are training and how it is done to see whether the learning transfer to our activities of daily living. This in itself entails another lecture, so I will not get into the details. But in short, a meta-analysis, which is a quantitative summary of cognitive training and physical exercise studies over the last 50 years, do show that our executive functions, uh, which is the um, related to the fluid intelligence, do actually improve in older adults through these types of training. They found that in general, mental stimulation, physical exercise, and social engagement shows gains uh, in fluid intelligence. What if we combined both exercise and cognitive training together? Would it boost our cognitive function? In our lab, uh, together with Dr. Masato Kawabata at NIE, we have developed such a program and are in the midst of conducting this research. In short, our preliminary results to show that uh, older adults do benefit from this training and improve over time. Of course, uh, we started off much poorer than the younger ones, but we do show improvement. Uh, and uh, what's nice to see is that there are some transfer of effects to improve mental flexibility. So in conclusion, when we age, there are changes in cognition, brain function, and structure. But the change is not always for the worse. And because of neuroplasticity, we can still rewire our aging brains to learn better. And yes, because of neuroplasticity again, and flexibility in our behavioral uh, repertoire, we can indeed teach old dogs to learn new tricks. Okay, thank you very much for your attention and I hope you have learned something new today. Thanks, Prof Annabelle. That was really helpful. I think you've done a lot of research and what you shared actually covered a lot of things where we can use on our personal life as well as in training uh, in developing training programs for, for our workplace. So thank you for that. Um, we would have a few questions for you and also at the end of the session, we'll have more questions for you. But um, right now, one of the first questions is, um, how, how do you think lifestyle factors or how can we improve or change our lifestyle to uh, improve our learning? Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, some of the very basic uh, lifestyle factors, I think it's something that we don't like to hear, but we have to do. <laughs> is uh, exercise. Exercise actually has over time and time again show that it benefits not just our health over time, but our brain health. 
and also improves our mood, especially with the generation of dopamine neurotransmitters in our brain. And it helps to you know, show off the uh, stress, help us to manage our stress better as well. The other thing, uh, again, we repeat over and over again, which is actually tough for us to do is our sleep hygiene. I know I've been trying to do that since young. In fact, uh, our sleep, the sleep study in Singapore has shown our adolescents is one of the most sleep deprived children or uh, age group in the world. I mean, that's quite concerning. Uh, it has something to do with our uh, school schedule. <laughs> but nonetheless, as we age, because of um, the decrease in the rate of neuroplasticity, the more important we have to pay attention to our lifestyle because it can actually boost the uh, structural uh, functional activity uh, factors involved with neuroplasticity in our brain. So if we can do externally, so the environment is very important. And just now we also mentioned social engagement, like networking, these kind of activities right now we are having, learning tidbits, new things as we uh, go along to have these sessions uh, sort of uh, punctuated throughout our schedule would be very helpful. So these are sort of lifestyle factors we can do immediately uh, without not a lot of costs involved. Uh, so these are things that we can do, um, including the uh, habit or what we hope to say the culture for lifelong learning to uh, have that in our daily activities and uh, lifestyle. So that can help us to improve uh, neuroplasticity over time and increase our flexibility uh, for our behavior. Sounds good. Yeah, sleep, sleep for me is also a problem. And I'm actually shocked to hear that adolescents, young people in Singapore are getting so little sleep. Um, we really should, really should make time for sleep and exercise, which leads to another question from an audience. Um, is there a minimal exercise duration or, uh, you know, if, if you had to choose a duration or a type of exercise, what would you recommend? for no, the best actually, desired result. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be for an exercise uh, figure out <laughs> the answer. But from what we know from um, longitudinal studies, they have this huge uh, longitudinal studies in the United States where they looked at all factors from lifestyle to cognition, to nutrition, to even driving. Uh, what they found is on average over a week, if you can spend two to three times a week, if you do aerobic exercise, half an hour, 20 minutes to 30 minutes will be enough um, if you can. And also follow that 10,000 steps a day where active SG is trying to make us do. Um, that would be helpful to keep, always keep, keep yourselves on your feet. And one thing um, that would be helpful when you're learning is um, you can stand up to move with breaks. Like later on, maybe we want the audience to stand up <laughs> at home just to get the blood to the brain uh, to give us some intervals when we have to pay attention for too long. So like 15, 15 minutes interval, you know, take a short break, stand up, move around. Uh, that will keep your uh, brain going. But uh, exercise wise, if you can, 20 to 30 minutes aerobic is good, but don't overdo it as well <laughs> because our joints are not as good <laughs> as well. We don't want to overdo it. So. Usually a, a, a exercise a sports um, physiologist will, will sort of suggest you mix both strength training with aerobics to, to help with both brain health and physical health. Mm, best of both worlds then. <clears throat> yep. I think we have time for one more question for you and a quick one. Um, is there any study connecting psychological theories and neuroscience findings. For example, in psychological studies, we know challenges of variety in the job. Having a coach who coaches employees, etc. would help people learn. And um, what are the correlates or parallels of these psychological factors in neuroscience research? Yeah, in fact, there, there are a lot of uh, factors uh, that's ongoing. Research is, is ongoing. So there was just, uh, just to bring up one example I mentioned in there but didn't elaborate on. Just in 2020 last year, they published a, a study looking at learning uh, with personality. So they found that um, a, a cognitive reserve, right? People with a higher cognitive reserve 
groups were correlated with certain personality styles. So they used the big five personality inventory. Uh, this is actually looking a, at a elderly uh, sample in Italy. <laughs> so haven't done yet in Singapore. But what they found is three personality factors such as openness to exploration. There's always learning new things, wanting to find out more is actually correlated with higher cognitive reserve. Um, being agreeable or friendly it helps because that will improve your social networking as well, um, like a strong, cohesive uh, social network. And um, the other uh, is um, extroversion, which is also a bit related to social um, networking. So wanting to always go out there and probably be more giving. Uh, so positive thinking and all that is also related. So interestingly, because you wouldn't think that personality is related to cognitive reserve in that sense, but if we go back to looking at neural networks, right? All these activities actually enhance uh, the networks that's growing. So neuroplasticity is, going, uh, is still going on. So these networks are growing. So one thing I always tell my students is like, use it or lose it, right? So we have to keep learning. We have to keep practicing uh, because if we keep doing that, we are using our brain networks. We are scaffolding it, strengthening it. If we don't do it, we lose it. They slowly will, the dendrites or neurons will retract right? if we don't practice and use it. So if we keep practicing, learning new things, exploring new things, pushing ourselves a little bit, not too much, not too overstress, but pushing a bit every time uh, will really help uh, in terms of brain health and um, cognitive reserves. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. His brain is like a muscle and it takes up so much energy anyway, so we might as well put it to use. <laughs> All right. Um, thanks, Prof. Annabelle. We've got actually several more questions. I hope we can cover them during the group Q&A session. But um, for now, thank you so much for sharing your research. I think it's been very insightful. And um, now we'd like to move on to our second speaker. Um, now that we've heard about the research and the knowledge, let's hear from Ms. Florence Ruan, who has experienced designing and delivering trainings with her title, um, learning with mature learners. Florence, the stage is yours. All right, uh, thanks, Jun. Can you hear me loud and clear? Yes, and I can see your screen as well. Wonderful, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Uh, you can call me Florence. Some people call me Flo. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, learning with mature learners. Now, uh, Prof. Annabelle did a lot of research. Uh, Florence, uh, it's an practical uh, practical person, uh, I will probably think that we could use some of this research and apply it to our life. I think June just now has um, mentioned, I, I have a motto in my life, that is living is learning, learning is living. And it's so well said, right? Because uh, aging is a truth. Nobody can stop that. Nobody can say no to that but how do we get our lives uh, a lot more interesting and our brain is uh, working all the way, all right? So that is part of learning. Now, uh, in my work, uh, I, I am an adult educator. I'm also a consultant in digitalization. Uh, so I interact with all kinds of learners and I do have uh, learners who are mature learners uh, range. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll put them across the age I have uh, uh, learners who is as old as 73 years old. I have learners uh, who are as, as young as 23 years old. So maybe I put the two together average, probably my learners are 40-ish, all right? Yeah, so today what I'm gonna share here is my experience and with my interactions with the mature learners. Now, of course, nevertheless, you can't have a class of all mature learners, neither gonna have all of them in the young ones. So it's always a challenge, but I love this challenge. How do you manage these two groups of learners, right? But for the sake of today's uh, really title and the purpose, I will talk more about mature learners. All right, I think let's begin with an end in mind. So what does that mean? Well, our end state, and truly uh, besides 
aging, which is something you can't stop. But I think, um, you know, we can really control the way we want to think, the want to be behaved, and our mindset. So have the end in mind as the mindset. We can learn a lot. We can go attend classes after classes. But if your mindset is always thinking that, hey, you know what? I'm six feet down deep. I may not have a tomorrow, but let's do a day at a time. So C.S. Lewis has once said, you are never, 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 never too old to set a goal or dream to a new dream. Okay, same goes with learning. It's never, never too old to learn. It's never, never too late to learn, right? Now, the question is the process of learning, as what Prof. Annabelle has said, you know, that is, you, you got to make it many methods. You can come from the sound, you can come from the way we think, the way we act, and the way we even action. Now, I hope I have time to surprise you um, one of the items afterwards. If I have time, I'll sing to you in one of the lessons I did it for uh, uh, some classes before, if I have the time, all right? Let's wait and see. So what's the highlights for today? Well, basically, let's do it this way, right? The highlights of today is, like it or not, there are mature learners coming and say, oh, no, no, no. How to get over the fear of technology and learn anything online, right? Now, this is the biggest challenge that most mature learners are facing. They can come into a class to learn, yet fearful of learning, right? But now, with, with pandemic, many are learning through online. And before they can get into the what learning outcome or what's the purpose of learning, they already form a barrier to themselves and say, I cannot, I just cannot Zoom. I just cannot be active on all these online tools as these young people are going through, right? So I think having that in mind, let's not be fearful. Let's conquer fear. And how can we do that? Right. I know some of you are HR, uh, L&D people. Some of you are even adult educators. Some of you are going to be adult educators. Some of you are even more professional, more experienced than I am, all right? But however, let's address back to the basic, the frameworks and the principles. Now we know adult learning got many principles. There's many framework that we can follow. Now these frameworks and principles didn't fall down from the sky or fall from anywhere. Uh, it is done and supported by how people, adults behave in learning, even more so with the mature learners that our brain is deteriorating as Prof, Prof has said it, but there are means of making it active. I'm so happy to hear that Prof says, hey, you know, one way of doing your brain, making it live and active is education, right? That is learning. So speaking to some of you who are adult educators, who are trainers, facilitators, coach, whoever you are, or L&Ds in the HR department, let's address back to the basic, back to the basic, the frameworks and the principles, and have the right design and tools to engage your mature learners, okay? The word is engage, so that they don't feel alone, they don't feel fearful. The other part is the beliefs and the values of mature learners. Mature learners actually come with a lot of values, by the way. They have very strong beliefs. The question is, did you know about it? Okay, so let's move on. I just want to um, kind of uh, borrow a 4C framework that a group of us in AEs uh, and also working with another group of uh, adult educators or even, I would say, they are uh, professors in, in Thailand. So Jokbint and Ngok, okay, they are people from Thailand that we work quite closely. Just happens that we found one another and we ask ourselves, what is this innovation producing ecosystem? Now, it, it all means that there are certain concepts that we will have to support it so that we make uh, learning so innovative so that we're able to produce results through innovation, actually through innovative learning. 
I think first thing first, let's look at what we call the competence. Now I know actions, yeah? I'm a very action-packed person. I know I can't see you. June, you got to tell me, whoever out there, you all can see Florence, yeah? Competency is defined, the knowledge, right? It's about skills and also uh, the practition, okay? All right, the attitude. So usually when I kind of tell my learners, I have action, even in class I did that, but now no more class, I'm doing Zoom. So if everybody with me, actually competency or competence defined by three H. All right, so action. June, I, I think you can see Florence. Huh? First H is the head. So we point to a head. Head is connective. Yes, we learn knowledge, our H. First H, the head, we learn knowledge. Now, second thing, after you learn, you really talk about the second H, which is the heart. Come show your chest to me, you can. The heart puts both hands together and then put it onto the left-hand side, the heart. Why? Because it is about the attitude of learning, right? You have the knowledge, you have the right attitude, and you apply, and then the third H is your hand. Come, roll your hands and say hands. So hands. when I... <laughs> yes, hands, right? exactly. So I when can't I, see everybody, but I'm sure some of us are following yeah, along. Yes, yes, correct. <laughs> Actually, when you do things like this, even online, it's okay. Because when I, I, I really relate competency to my learners, the hate, the heart, and the hands. And they get it. Because we are trying to learn something to be able to remember. Maybe the words not so remember, but knowing it. Having the right attitude to turn the knowledge, which is your heart, into practice, which is your hands. So competency is skills mastery. Right, and the second thing is, like it or not, today, whether pandemic comes or not coming, technological readiness is part of our life, but pandemic accelerated it, forcing many people to go online. It's the capacity. So if you're talking about learning, you really talk about the portion of technology. Now, nobody learns alone today, eh? collaboration. Community building, team collaboration, a process assessment, alignment. The best thing is co-create. You can co-create your learning even in the class, right? To choose. Last but not least, all learners have the culture, values, and beliefs, and even to the own thought processes. Okay. So the 4C framework, if you look at it, is none of it can stand by itself. It means we have competency, we have capabilities, we have collaboration. Last but not least, the culture towards how we put these three things together, impacted by the environment, the connectedness of things, and giving it a very holistic integrated education system. Now, of course, outside circle, uh, we come in and look at the institution, the government, and the community. So we believe, uh, you know, that this bunch of our AEs here, adult educators, believe that really you don't just train for the train of training or you know conduct your lesson plan as follows, but it's through this four C concept. Well, let's go down to uh, the next principle: is the competency. So putting all these things together is basically go back to your principle. I don't have time to go through the principles. I know time is running out a little bit, but you are adult educators. We know the Markom knows principles, right? We don't force adult to learn because they came with a purpose or they come with a purpose because they're self-directed. And I tell you, there's so much things to tell you, especially the mature learners. The storytelling is brilliant because they have so much life experience. Quote, unquote, I think uh, Prof has mentioned, huh? mature learners come with them the older you are, the wiser you are. Uh, Prof, I think I quoted one of the statements. Thanks for worrying. The older you are, the wiser you are. So life experience. And they come with the fact that, hey, I don't think so, I'm old. I want to achieve certain goals and I need it to be applied. So how do you do this, right? Instructional designs. So very quickly, let me just run through. For face-to-face, -face, we present, discuss, reflect, debrief, common instructional methods. But can I say that for mature learners online, videos, didactic questioning, tell a story, action, like what I did just now, 
Or you may even have activities, go and collect something from the house that represent a certain lesson learning outcome that you have. So they get out of the chair, they go pick something and they show you. Or maybe after lunch, we're going to have a discussion about leaders. Dress like a leader. Go get them, dress like a leader and come back and la la, you know, they are leaders out of them. Now, in class, face-to-face, -face, we do a lot of face-to-face -face like games and cards. Online, we do tools, okay? If you may allow me, what are tools? This is a jam board. Now, I have no time to actually show you, but I can share the link to all my learners and all my learners jam into a board and they start looking and moving things. Jigsaw puzzle, there you go, all right? And then we talk about it. Now, uh, I could actually share this with everybody, but in lieu of time, I can't do that, yeah? But this is what I'm trying to say. You can use uh, simple tools, huh? very simple tools to combine things and show them. And drag and drop, right? I'll get them to have a mouse, drag and drop, that's all they need. So in face-to-face, -face, we do a lot of skill practice, right? But when you go online, you still do a lot of skill practices through videos, uh, but most important, my point here, support your learners. Support your learners, co-learn together. What do you mean co-learn together? I'll show you a trailer board afterwards, yeah, in a minute. So what I'm trying to say here is very simple. Life didn't change. We're still adult educators, but what has changed is we have to look for something that we're comfortable with in online, and also, don't forget our sound. You see, for, I mean, I'm a very expressive person. Eh? The sound, the actions, make it engaging. Make it exciting. Make it meaningful for them. Okay? All right. Now, um, what happens here is this Neopod. I'm going to play this. Uh, basically, I play this to tell you that I'm not advertising for Neopod. Don't get me wrong. I'm no share in there. But I find that there are certain tools you can use to use just a share link. And then from there, you're able to uh, have all the quiz, uh, WhatsApp, uh, sorry, web page, or simply by keeping and typing. So you self-learn out of the class. So let me then, I hope you can hear the sound, yeah? Introducing Jun, Nearpod. sound okay? With Nearpod, you can make every yeah, lesson okay. active. Launch lessons your students can't wait to join with collaborative engaging activities like virtual reality, simulations, and gamified quizzes. As the teacher, you'll always know where your students are with Nearpod's formative assessments, including polls, open-ended questions, draw-its, and more. Get started with what you already have. Upload any of your favorite resources, PowerPoints, Google Slides, and videos, including directly from YouTube. Then. Add in media and formative assessment in a few clicks. And now you can add questions directly into videos to make them interactive. Get started even faster with our library of pre-made lessons and videos, built in partnership with some of your favorite brands. You can use them as is or customize to meet the unique needs of your students. Once you're ready to launch your lesson, choose from three teaching modes. In live participation mode, you control the pace and students participate on their devices, either in person or remotely with web conferencing. In student-paced mode, students move through and participate on their own, whether they're working from home or in class working in centers, stations, or groups. With front-of-class mode, you can use Nearpod without student devices and facilitate collaborative discussions. Okay. Now, in your time, I want to stop here. Basically, what Florence is trying to say here is as follows, yeah? There are many tools. Choose the one that you are comfortable with and choose the one that you can record videos and show it to your mature learners. A mature learners like Korean movies, okay? We don't give them Korean movies, huh? And we record on your own and show it to them. What are the things that can see? Because the minute they see along with you, right? They are with you. They know you're looking after them. I've got mature learners telling me, friends, you know what I like about your class? You have a lot of tools, but I'm not scared because you are with me. And mind you, I'm also getting Imagine. people together. What do I do? I actually let learners learn among themselves. After all, learners are all human beings, huh? because learners value to offer and take. There's some young learners they will offer their technology tools 
all right, to all the learners. And the learners who are the more mature ones, they will just kind of share the experience, right? So you have Zoom, break up rooms. So break up into smaller rooms, and then you can have peer learning. Um, I've done things like very worried mature learners um, partner with the young ones. And then I set the stage for them to say, hey, what can you offer when you're mature learners? And what can you offer as a young learner? And I tell you, it works brilliantly. And last but not least, capture your team co-creation together. Now, what does that mean? Just give me a minute or so. Um, it's like this, okay? I use a lot of uh, after-class kind of learning bots with pictures, with videos, where they actually can watch after that. And I just built this bot up. And then after that, I share with them. Now, what's so difficult by going in, click, click again, expand the picture. It's all about clicks, right? So with that, they're able to then follow. And what is interesting is they do the classwork. They capture all the classwork inside the cart. And then after that, they will go back at their own time, revise it, fall on, I mean, use it for the assessment or assignment. Now, this works very well for many people. That, this is Trello, this is Paletta. Uh, I know I don't have much time to kind of uh, go through. But last slide here is three key takeaway. Knowledge only becomes powerful when you can put it in use. Practice, learning transfer. And age and tech is not going to go away. It's here to stay. Ignorance is a choice. But supporting one another is, in learning is a hope. And last but not least, education learning has no restriction of age and overcome the mindset. All right? So I know I passed my 15 minutes, but I did promise you that Florence sing to you, and I, I, I think I train myself all the way. Uh, this is one of my class that I teach or train, our talents become our strength because I'm a Gallup strength coach. And, you know, as you kind of put some slides lah, huh, onto it and play, um, not sure. Okay. Did you hear any sound? Yeah. Okay. June, just two minutes, I finished this part. Okay. All right. Yeah. So you put a song together. Through some words that's meaningful to them. Okay, here I go. Listen to your heart when there are many games. Take each game and turn them into strength. Live believing you can discover talents can be your mighty strength. Okay, I'm gonna pause here, no time already, yeah? Okay, my apology. But I tell you what, you know, these little things that you show your extra steps, they learn along with you, okay? So with that, I say thank you one more time. Okay, Joan, and uh, I hope you have a good, a good session here. So sorry, I could run a little bit faster, but what I'm trying to say is, it's possible. You just have to put some time to plan and see who are your learners and give them what's your commitment to them. If you can support them, they are with you. All right? Thanks again. Thanks, Florence. Wow, you're really talented. And I can see that you're really passionate about helping your students, not just, you know, focusing on the thing that we want to deliver, but really to understand where they're coming from, what their challenges might be and, and how can make them feel good and learn well. Yeah. So... Yeah, I think the main takeaway for me from, from you today is that teachers should really understand what their learners need to be able to develop the right sort of teaching tools and techniques to maximize the learning. And um, it's with that in mind, you know, the idea of understanding who our learners are and their needs that we shall now head on to hear from Ms. Carolyn Ng, who will, learn, uh, who will share more about the mature learners uh, characteristics and learning needs. Carolyn? whenever you're ready. Thank you, June. And good afternoon to every one of you. Um, so let me just share screen for this afternoon. Uh, somehow, where's my slides? Right. So, and um, thank you, June, for the earlier introduction. Uh, I am currently, uh, actually, I face mature learners on a daily basis. 
every day because uh, here at the uh, TGLF uh, Senior Activity Centre, we have people who are actually in the retiring, retiring stage or they have already retired, right? Um, and so my first question for all of you is if you can type into the text box, who will be a mature learner in your opinion? You know, keep your answers coming. You have four choices here. Um, who is a mature learner? Tell me in your opinion, who do you classify as a mature learner? Right, it'd be interesting to see your answers. All of them. <laughs> two, two. We've got a lot of answers coming on. You know, and to answer, while you're typing in your answers, I'd like to reiterate what Prof Chen has mentioned earlier. Um, I have been working with uh, seniors for the last uh, three, four years, actually, in particular. Uh, and uh, we have noticed many things and we want to bring in um, one highlight to all of you that um, we need to work in the framework of active aging. Uh, active aging intervention has four pillars. You've got um, social, you've got physical, uh, and we've got the wellness aspect and finally the financial parts, right? And in actual fact, when Prof mentioned um, about how neuroplasticity is actually happening, um, that it is really true because we have seen our seniors uh, in our activity centers, those who regularly participate uh, in activities, um, they are cognitively sharper. And on top of that, they are also more alert, right? When this happens for these learners, right, for these adult, uh, these mature residents, what happens is that um, they have a, a more um, enlightening uh, perspective. They look at uh, the world issues differently and they are of a lesser burden to the younger ones in their family because they can help themselves much more. And in fact, um, where I am uh, at this center here, um, I have a lot of 70s and 80s who are actually looking after the younger ones. When I say the younger ones, I'm referring to their adult children, meaning that they are in, their adult children are in their 40s and 50s. Uh, it pains my heart every day when I see um, the 80-year-old amas, grandpas and grandmas who are actually looking after their sick children who are in their 40s and 50s. Recently, one of my residents here, um, she's in her 70s and she has to worry for her 30 plus year old son who went through a heart stenting operations. You know, and this is really um, what's happening in our local scene. And therefore, when, when uh, Prof mentioned about um, we need to keep learning. We need to just keep uh, our neuroplasticity, our brain keep going on, the cognitive abilities going on. It is really true because if we can keep that going on, then your abilities to support yourself will be a lot stronger as you retire. All right. And really learning never ends and there are many ways to end. Um, and thank you everyone for participating in this first poll uh, where you say all. But in actual fact, I would like to share with you that um, under uh, WHO uh, and even in our Singapore context, 35 years old and below is considered as a youth, not even mature learner. So Junhan, I think you're still um, under youth section, yeah? <laughs> all right. I, I'm and category four. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, and interestingly, um, uh, there is a, a, a new statement in the market, right, that actually says 50-year-olds are the new youth. They are called the old youth. And we have a new term for this group of mature learners. We call them middle sense. Okay, why we call them middle sense? Because they are middle age with an adolescent um, body um, development curve. Because when we hit our age of 50, we are actually going through um, a lot of emotional changes, a lot of uh, life changes, and also we are going through huge amount of hormone changes. And many life perspectives actually change for us during this period of time, including why we want to learn, right? 
So let me bring you to my next slide. As you can see, and this is actually correct, this particular graph um, is done by this uh, Seattle Longitudinal Study, which has started in 1956 and it's still ongoing at this point of time. And you can see that this uh, particular study is very similar to what Prof Chen has actually showed all of you just now. And it shows that when you are heating at your 50s, it is your peak. So in Chinese, we have a saying, uh, um, at this age is your golden years. You know, so this is really very prime and therefore we should maximize the these golden years of ours because we are learning and and is it necessary to continue to learn? Yes, if you are um, seeking a second career, if you want a longer runway for yourself, whether it's personal development or even for uh, your personal hobbies and so forth this stage of mature learners, the before stage, that means you prep yourself so that you can uh, go to your prime stage at the most uh, efficient uh, abilities, right? So take note that your mature learners actually have a lot of capacity to learn even uh, at this age. And there's a lot of expansion of room for expansion for all of them. Now, I'd like to ask all of you here, you know, which way do we learn as an adult? Mature learners, left or right? Just type left or right for your answer. Okay, it's very interesting because, wow, I've got very smart learners here, you know, and we can see that our uh, participants are very wide awake and this is another form of getting your learners to be very participative, even in an online situation. I just like to reiter reiterate another point when um, Florence mentioned that technology is here to stay. And yes, and but the adult learners, especially the very mature learners, all right, as we call them, the OO, um, they have concerns not because they are fearful of learning. It's not that they are fearful of learning, but they have other concerns. When we were trying to um, uh, initiate digital classes for our seniors, many of them say, no, 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 I don't want. Uh, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do that. Getting onto the tablet is just too scary for me. But the truth is, it is not. They just don't want to disturb their family members because it is work from home for a lot of their family members. So is it that they are fearful of learning? No, they want to learn. In fact, they want to recap what they've learned. And so this allow me to show you these two, what they are. Now the left side is actually how we go through, what we go through in our education years. It's called the pedagogy and it's very teacher oriented and very much teacher led and very subject oriented. But as we mature, we go into what we call the andragogy where we are self-oriented and we decide where we want to go. And we learn because we want to solve a particular problem or we want to identify certain things that is gonna benefit us in particular. And this is how we are uh, self-motivated, right? So mature learners learn um, much better when they are internally motivated. Now, allow me to show you this curve. Uh, as you can see here, we are at this stage where we have mature learners. Actually, right now in Singapore, um, millennials are starting to uh, are over here and we the Gen X, I'm, uh, well, I'm considered to be Gen X and I think um, June, you're not a millennial anymore. <laughs> you're actually Gen Z. Right? Um, not sure. Should, be, <laughs> should, be, should still should be, be millennial. <laughs> yeah, you should be in between. Oops. Somewhere there. Somewhere there. Now, um, the way our environment is, right, actually affects the way we learn. So if you can see this journey here, um, the background of how we grow up, the environment actually uh, help us to understand why each of us in our different age groups learn differently. Um, and not because we are actually afraid of technology, but because we are very accustomed to a certain style of learning when we were young. And then as we mature, we start to adapt and adopt 
new methods of learning. As you can see, as the journey of uh, evolution comes about, the different types of uh, learning kits, learning uh, methods actually have starts changing. And today, if you look at the millennials um, and the Gen Zs and right now the generation alphas, they are learning purely online. Um, and they are also incorporating face-to-face um, -face or rather uh, what we call uh, uh, hands-on kits, right? Uh, standalone reusable learning objects and so forth um, in their learning process. Today, when they learn robotics, they don't just learn robotics through coding. They actually learn robotics in other methods as well. So when we work with mature learners, right, we actually need to understand that their concept of learning is pretty much in this area of lectures, workshops, books, manuals, exploration, and um, some of them go through learn to play. So you need to adapt to your learners and help them to feel comfortable. So some characteristics of the adult learners. One of the very key one is that um, the adult learner experience is very much what they've accumulated over the time, right? And when they are ready to learn, when they come into their classroom, they are just eagerly waiting for you to provide with the information, right? Um, and this is where their motivation comes in. Plus at the same time, right? Um, these learners, when they are interested, um, when you post them a discussion, they start sharing so much that you don't even have to tell them to talk. They will just talk. They will take over your class. One time I had this particular class well, of uh, civil servants and I broke them into classrooms and gave them a topic and they were just carrying on and they didn't want to stop because it was a topic that they had a lot to share about and they had a lot of commonalities and they just took off on their own and they were learning from one another. At the end of the day, they realized that they enjoyed uh, coming to the course, which they dreaded in the beginning because they thought that it was just going to be another one of those um, sessions where it's going to be theoretical. Adult learners don't like theories. They want to be doing hands-on. They want to do uh, real work. They want to be able to participate. We had a um, program that we brought into the center here, which was actually by the Sound Foundation. Um, and it was called the Learning Room. Initially, everybody got very excited the first lesson because there was exercises um, during the class. They were doing activities. As the program went on, um, there was a lot more cognitive and it was more didactic, more seated down. The learners in our center start to drop down. So like what um, Prof earlier said, the adult learners need to be constantly moving. They, they can't sit down uh, because they, are, they need to actually move about to actually have that um, uh, energy, right? And when, you, when we put out other type of classes, for example, Nagomi art, when we put out Zumba classes and so forth, the number of participation actually went up and their retention rate was actually higher because they are actively doing it in uh, opposed to where they were facing a didactic sessions. So when they are in a session, the adult learners want to be doing it because they need to learn, they want to learn, they want to do things, they want to have the freedom to do things of their own, and they want to have a very experiential um, session. They are not here for academic learning, but they want to learn things that are important and they want it to be very encouraging. Very interesting is that um, when we have seniors in the sessions, right? Um, when they're able to do things and surpasses their own expectations, they continue to come in. They continue to participate because they find that they have overcome um, themselves. So one of the activities we run here, it's called the square steps. Um, square steps is meant to be a, a cognitive exercise where you're supposed to follow the leader in doing your footsteps. You may actually Google square steps. It's a Japanese exercise. Um, and I've actually uh, participated together with the seniors uh, on their sessions. And strangely, I actually perform less than them because I have less sleep. Uh, <laughs> 
we were we were doing this, and I wish I could show you the video. Um, the seniors who have better sleep actually are able to remember uh, the steps better, but they had a lot more fun because they have somebody to play with them, to talk to them, and the trainer uh, is very encouraging, and so they will continue to come in. So like what Florence mentioned earlier, right, it is very important uh, for the trainer to be very encouraging and to be positive because your vibes actually will influence the learners. Um, and therefore, I like to now um, show you one of the activities that I do with my online sessions. I give them things like this. Um, this has a bit of a cognitive as well as a bit of um, action. They have to move around. They have to go and find things and they come and talk about it. Right, so these actually gets them a little bit excited as well, and uh, part of it is another action where I get them to talk about their favorite colors, and they will go on and on and on, and that's what they really want to do. They want to talk, they want to be heard. Senior learners, mature learners, they want to be heard, not the other way around. They would like to hear some theory, but your class sessions could be. Um, arranged in such a way is what we call 7 to 1. 70% is participation, 20% theory, and 10% is for them to feed back to you what they feel, what they think. And I like to share this particular book with you um, because the session today is rather tight. Um, you have this QR code here you can scan to read about this book written by Barbara Strike, um, which talks about the secret life of the grown-up brain. Um, and there are many, many, many interesting points in this particular book that uh, I don't have time to share with you in this session. And I hope that you can actually find the opportunity to watch this video online as well. Um, and you may find that you are able to uh, find some techniques that you can incorporate in your sessions. And lastly, I'd like to share with you that it's important to understand the learners. So when you're planning your classrooms, you're planning your activities, understand the background of your learners, right? Empathize with them. And these will allow you to then respond to the needs of the learners, especially mature learners. Right. And that's all from me for today. All right. Jane. Thanks, Carolyn. That was very insightful. I think I think really the main highlight is that we, we cannot just be teaching the way we teach students or learning the way we learned when we were younger, but we have to incorporate a lot of interactions and movements, more mediums to absorb the information and apply them in classes and outside of classes. So thank you for that. I think that's really useful. Um, one question I have for you uh, to kick things off in the in the individual Q&A is, um, well, how do you assure mature learners in class when you pair them up with uh, younger learners? So very often, right, when the, uh, when the adult learn, when the mature learners are, pet, are in a classroom full of younger learners, they always feel that they are um, less able uh, and they will be ridiculed or they will be uh, scrutinized by the younger ones that like they have certain expectations. And we need to actually um, assure and also affirm their contributions during the class time, right? And more often than not, the younger ones actually have uh, a lot more to learn from the mature learners uh, than the uh, senior learners from the younger ones. One example, um, when we are talking about, uh, in one of our classes where we talk about workplace conflict and we have uh, senior um, learners in the classroom and they talk about how they will uh, resolve a conflict is very different from how a younger one will resolve the conflict and they will share perspectives, right? And so this allows, uh, we will encourage the senior learners to share how they solve it and why they solve it that way. And this gives the younger learners a chance to also um, affirm how the older um, workers are thinking as well. That's cool. Yeah, I think, you know, as a younger person myself, sometimes when, when I speak to my colleagues, their insights and experience really, I, I, 
if they don't tell me, I could never actually think of it on my own. So there's, there's a lot to, to be learned from the old, older learners. And it, it's quite funny that, you know, sometimes, as you said, sometimes older learners hesitate to be paired with younger learners. Yeah. Um, one, one other question I had also was that, um, how, how do mature learners respond with technology? Do, is there any difference as compared to the younger learners? Um, older learners actually need to, because from the mature learners, as we mentioned just now, they are, although they have seen the adoption of technology, but because of their learning um, experience, they prefer to stick to traditional tools. Um, and their past experience of um, technological breakdown actually gives them the fear of not trusting technology. It's not that they don't like technology, but they are very afraid of solving the technological breakdowns. So one of um, during one of our sessions um, recently, the mature learners um, really didn't like um, the online class for one reason. They they were they, there was nothing wrong with the laptop. It was because of the office network. They were in the office. And they were listen. They were actually participating at the office, um, and it's something that they couldn't resolve. It's not within their control, and they didn't know what to do. So this actually makes it difficult for them to trust technology because they don't know what to say. And when they have the younger learners in the classroom with them, um, the younger learners sometimes think that the um, mature learners are just, you know, not wanting to try without understanding that the mature learners may have already tried, but they really do not know the ins and outs of where to solve the problem. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a problem of the, the stereotype thinking where we think, you know, the older learners think a certain way of the younger learners and, and vice versa, but we need to yeah. break down that stereotype uh, to collaborate in the learning. Um, one more question from our audience. While we look at the way mature learners learn today, what about the younger learners? Um, the pace is so different. And so do you think we should separate the two groups because maybe the younger learners might be a little bit impatient? Um, yes, I personally would prefer to separate uh, younger learners, but however, let's also define what do we mean by younger learners? Okay, it's really interesting. If you put, say, a toddler, a kindergarten kid or a primary school kid with a mature learner, as opposed to you put a teenager and, uh, say, a, a poly student, a university adult student with a mature learner, there is a difference in terms of response. All right. Um, and sometimes it's not just about um, a younger learner in terms of perspectives, but rather the personality or the empathy the younger learner have. So I do have volunteers here who are in their poly years or in their JC years, even in their um, secondary school years. They actually have more, some of them have more patience um, to talk to the older folks to teach. So we do have like NUS students, SMU students, NTU students who come by to teach um, cyber lessons. That means they teach digital literacy to the, to the older learners. And they are learning at the same time of how to talk. So there are good things to pair uh, with the mature learners and the younger learners. But in a way, I would say that the younger learners would be the trainer and the mature learners are the learners themselves. And you can see quite interesting um, interactions if the younger learners have already been given um, a background, a context of who their demographics are and prep them to know what to expect with the mature learners. So we always tell them what their concerns of the seniors are and what they hope to learn from the sessions and what they like. So recently we were conducting this session with NUS for digital literacy. Um, and in their, in their experience of conducting the sessions, they found that the seniors actually, the mature learners actually want to learn the fun stuff that the younger ones are doing, such as TikTok, such as Snapchat, because they see what the young ones are doing, but they don't know how to do it. They, they, they say, it's so fun. Why can't you teach us what to do? You know, then we can do the same thing with our um, family members. So they want to learn. 
but they need a lot of patience, they need a lot of empathy. So uh, I personally have always enjoyed pairing younger ones with mature learners because you will also help the younger learners to have empathy. And at the same time, you get the senior learners to voice out for themselves. They speak up and then they will overcome their fears of learning uh, something different or for the fears of speaking to the younger ones. Mm -hmm. So from what you say, I'm hearing that, you know, you really need to understand what your training or teaching objectives are and mm. also to understand where each group might be coming from. And then during your sessions, uh, help both of them integrate into each other into a class coherently. Then the whole session can, can go on smoothly and, and benefits both groups. So, that's right. so that's that's really good. And um, I think the rest of the questions are more, uh, they, they can be answered by multiple speakers and, and it'll be great to hear multiple perspectives from everyone. So um, let's let's move on to the group Q&A and dialogue. But before we do that, uh, I just like, like, like to give everyone a few minutes, or, okay, a few seconds to think about any questions that you have and, and send it in the chat in, in the uh, Q&A feature on Zoom. And while you do that, um, just like to share with you that InLab would like to request for your session feedback. Um, this will help the, the team organize better events on topics that you like, on formats that could be better for you guys. And um, while you're preparing your questions or while you're thinking or consolidating your thoughts, you can scan the QR code and our, our, our team would also send the survey link to you via the chat. And this QR code and the, the survey link will be announced later again as well towards the end of the session. All right. And um, now for, for the group Q&A and dialogue, um, this question, the, the first question that we have is um, how to help mature learners overcome this term, I am not tech savvy. So can I learn online if I'm not tech savvy? And um, I, I think this question could be directed to Florence first and, and perhaps Carolyn or Prof Annabelle, whoever has any thoughts can chime in at any time. Um, Florence, would, would you like to go first? Sure, yeah. I think this is alluding to the first question as well. How how then you, know, you, you see young learners, uh, uh, younger learners and mature learners, now, I think that the word fear, right? It comes to the word fear. Uh, that is a lot of um, what we call um, encouragement. I think uh, they do not know what they don't know. And therefore, there's always this fear. You know, it's like a barrier. I think we need to remove a barrier by, first of all, when you, you, when you start really a session, you don't know your learners. But through the interaction with your learners, you really start to observe what kind of learners do you have, right? And you will notice that some are the very shy ones and uh, some are the fearful ones. And you want to encourage by first, don't use too much tech when you first start. You can always use voice, action, and you can always use sound, right? Um, and, and from there, you notice that some people and ask good questions. The other thing is to get people talking is ask a question and you're so, uh, if for example, if you're so, um, you're not, not so good at asking who wants to answer the question, there's this wheel of name where you can actually start relaxing people mood huh, by playing the wheel of name. And, and then when you click and it goes, gil, 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 ding, you know, that sound comes along, the mood comes along and we say, hey, Carol, can you answer this question? Simple questions. From there, what are you trying to establish? You're trying to establish comfort zone first, okay? Let me have a good mood first. Then I learn with you. Trust, relationship building. And after we have got into that, when your learners are trusting you and trusting among the cohort because the fact that you have to do it in the breakup rooms, simple questions and let them discuss, okay? Then you can actually get uh, the, the moment, the, the younger ones to show, hey, I know I, I can do Google Slacks and all this thing. They talk, 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 talk. Then the learners, the mature ones, hey, how do you do this? Uh, show me. Learning is a process. Learning can never be like, I tell, I tell, I tell, you pick that. No longer that. Learning is an experience. So therefore, we bring in emotion, we bring in psychology, we bring in the human factor. I hope that kind of answers the question that is remove fear by having the right environment and the right support, not by yourself as an adult educator. Make use of your cohort 
and let the younger ones step up to bless the rest. And let the mature learners to share. Remember, the older you are, the wiser you are. Oh, I really like this statement from Prof. Okay. <laughs> Hope that's helped. That definitely helps, Florence. Since, since you mentioned the prof um, and, and the, the theme of the recent questions touched about touch on emotions and fear. I was wondering, you know, from, from the research perspective, you talked a, a lot about the brain, the logical side of ourselves. Uh, what are your thoughts on the emotional side when it comes to mature uh, learners and learning? Yeah, this is a very good question. Um, in fact, uh, this is a new area that we are looking into, but uh, when we talk about neuropsychology or cognitive neuroscience, actually emotion is a big area in the brain. <laughs> raw emotions, and also uh, learning is affected by emotions as well. So we are also looking into social emotional processes uh, or networks, how that um, support or not support learning. So if we understand like uh, what Florence has said uh, from psychology, uh, there are a lot of uh, theories about emotion and learning. Uh, and also what we call learned helplessness as well that's uh, sort of uh, involved with emotion. So if we look at, for example, anxiety, uh, it is again your inverted U-shaped curve. Uh, we need a certain level of anxiety to get things going, to do things. If you're all relaxed and you know, not anxious at all, it's hard to get us to you know, complete that assignment, do that work. Just a little bit of anxiety actually helps us to think that, oh, I have to hand this up. I have to remember to do this, stuff like that. But if we go over <clears throat> that curve where the anxiety levels are too high, it interferes with our learning. So our mind goes blank. And the other thing is also like learned helplessness is like if we, keep trying, trying, but no solutions, right? And we get stuck uh, on our own, uh, it sort of stops the learning. So that's why just now what Caroline has mentioned, Florence has mentioned, collaborative learning is very, very important in, in a group, as, especially for older uh, uh, participants or, or mature learners. Um, and then you have a lot of social dynamics and emotions involved in collaborative learning. The very important thing Florence mentioned is trust in that group, willing to share, uh, willing to open up what our fears about learning. And uh, one of the, some of the questions I, I thought I saw somewhere is um, where they talked about, um, I think somebody asked, about uh, what if learning, right? If, if, um, if you become uh, fearful or, or you get stuck in, in learning. Um, yeah, I sort of lost my train of thought for a while. That's a, a, a more mature moment here. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's kind of like emotions uh, are very linked to our learning. And in terms of uh, cognitive science, we also have looked at what we call cool and hot decision-making. So usually when we talk in, in research, we know a lot about cool, like decision-making or learning, where we talk about like processing speed, uh, problem solving, we always talk about cool stuff. But in reality, when we problem solve, when we learn things, uh, we're actually in the hot mode because it, as a human, we can't piece it apart. In reality, emotions are there. If you're not motivated, right? That's also part of emotions. We can't really go forward and learn. So if something is interesting, exciting, that's why we need the engagement to, to have that positive emotion uh, as sort of the background in, in learning. So right now in research, we are going further into looking at brain signals. What's happening? during these kinds of interactions? And how do these activities support or interfere with learning? So I think there's still a lot of research uh, that we need to do, especially with collaborative learning when they look at uh, coherence uh, within diets or even groups, small groups, like how well we, we sort of co uh, think together and work together. 
So those are the areas, but definitely a lot of research support positive emotions are important, positive mood, trust and setting uh, are important to, to support and help learning. Thanks, Prof. Um, on the topic of engagement, collaboration, and, and being together, the setting of learning, that there's a question of, you know, our, our time right now, and, and it might or might not be related to the fear of using technology, but there's some people who might think that, hey, why don't I wait for the pandemic to be over before I head back to a familiar classroom face-to-face -face setting to learn? What, what do you think of this statement? Um, this open to anyone. I, I think it might be more relevant for Carolyn because you actually work with learners even through this stage and also for Florence when you're designing training delivered online as well. Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, the thing is this, in reality sets in, uh, we do not know, we, we know it was somewhere in November 2019, that's why it's called COVID-19, pandemic started. But we do not know what is the new, you know, or post-pandemic, because there's no date to it. So if whoever comes to me and tell me, I wait, then I say, okay, you wait until you turn frozen, okay? Then you still continue to wait. Because why? That nobody can tell you in the world when is COVID-19 be an X and no longer happen, right? So I, I, I tend to tell such people is that, what do you want to learn? All right. You learn something that is easy for you to digest. If you cannot learn the theory part, connected part, it's very difficult. Learn something that what you can be with your hands. Uh, instead of learning level three, go level two. Get your brain going, all right? Then you slowly uncover, discover, and you don't need to wait anymore. And such conversation happens. That means this is a pre-class. It's not talking about during class. It's talking about preparing the mood and the attitude towards learning. That's why I use the word mindset. Uh, as I really interacted with so many, so many learners, I, I surrender to the word mindset come first. Then the rest uh, can unfold by itself, one step at a time. And to reiterate uh, Florence's um, statement about mindset, right? I, I have actually um, um, used this saying to all my learners. When, when we are born, we have all sets of strengths. We have a full set of strengths. And over the years of growing up, we have forgotten to use some of these strengths that we have, and these strengths then becomes a weakness. So then it's time to actually wake up those weaknesses and make them your strength again. So you will have uh, strengths that are frequently used and strengths that are lesser used. And as we mature, then there will be strengths that, you know, we probably need to awaken the weaker strengths to help us to adapt to a new lifestyle or to um, overcome certain life changes or life sessions that we have to face. So many a times I ask people, um, why is it that we are reluctant to do certain things? What's the reason? Is it really we don't know how to do or we don't want to do? The don't know and the don't want is a very stark difference. And many a times, the one thing that comes in for all of us learners is procrastination. We keep giving excuses. We keep giving um, reasons to say that can come later. No, I don't need this strength. It's okay. I can use the other part. You know, one of the one of, uh, um, very interesting points I actually noticed in uh, some of my seniors who actually say that they have leg pains and all that. I say, if you have leg pains, uh, have you tried? Um, doing exercises to um, make that pain go away. They say, no, it's not going to go away. I say, why not? Have you tried it? You know, have you tried to move your other parts of muscles? Because when you have leg pains, you just keep using the set of muscles that doesn't give you the pain. Then over time, you become reliant on those sets of muscles. Then the muscles that are supposed to help you to walk becomes weakened. And that's how we actually lose our abilities. And this is the same thing for learning. If we continuously learn with um, one set of uh, tools, then we just go in that direction. Then we forget how to use the other set. And this is why um, 
when we say that there are so many areas of our brains that we need to, to use, we have to actually constantly, and I would say consciously, make an effort to train the different aspects of our learning. So in, in active aging, we actually need to incorporate um, three major areas. We say we need to do the social interaction because through social interaction, you are doing talking to people, you're interacting with people, you are making yourself to talk and learn from other people because social interactions actually do help you to learn. And when you do social interactions, it will lead you to do physical activities because you start to enjoy them. And this will bring about to your overall wellness. And then you start to say, hey, I want to join this group of people to say, uh, to, to, to actually play, say, table tennis. You know, then you start saying, okay, I want to be with them. Then I have to start doing this. I have to step out of my house. I have to start walking. I have to start learning to use certain things. So it's really about activating the strengths that we rarely used, or uh, as what Florence said earlier, the mindset. If you have the mindset, so when we are training or when we are teaching mature learners, we need to help them to understand that they have a mindset that is in their control. It is their choice, not other people's choice. If their choice is to learn, then everything is overcome. Well, that is very true. Thanks, Carolyn. And thanks, Florence, as well. Uh, you, you know, we, we've just been talking about willingness and the attitudes towards learning the mindset. I was wondering, also since Prof. Annabelle said, um, part of the big five personality traits is openness to learning. And there seems to be a stereotype. I'm, I'm sure it's not just me, you know, that um, sometimes older people are more resistant to, to try things out. They are less willing. Do you think that the, um, the trait openness um, declines over time? And, and how can we maintain that uh, level of openness as, as we age, as, as we encounter new things over time? And that's actually a very good question. Um, I'm not sure if people have look at, looked at it longitudinally, if openness actually declined, but as a personality trait, it's always there. So it's like, if you are scoring high on openness and learning, it persists with you. And that's why it's a personality trait. Um, but it, now we do see why uh, brain networks are Cognition actually is actually supporting that. So if you're open to new ideas learning, you actually would practice that, right? You would uh, search for new things to learn and um, try out different places, go travel and, and stuff, explore, right? Become an explorer uh, in various levels. Uh, through doing that, we are interacting. So again, your brain will be forming new networks, like what Caroline was saying. Uh, you know, if you try different things uh, differently, right? Be open to new methods, try it out. You're actually forming new networks. And because of these new networks, you're, you're promoting uh, neurogenesis in a way as well, or promoting connections of different networks together. So it does help this agility or maintain uh, some of this. And uh, I wanted also to get back to this mindset thing because openness has some connection with mindset as well. Um, although we talk about personality being sort of set, but it's not that true anymore. Now, now we know that uh, we can change, right? Because of neuroplasticity, we, we can think differently. So the setting the mindset Right, we, uh, we have this thing called growth mindset. I know uh, both Lawrence and Carolyn probably are very familiar with that. Uh, coming more from neuroscience perspective, since that because our networks, brain networks can change even that we are old <laughs> or um, mature, uh, there's still growth going on. So we believe that we can change and uh, the power of belief actually is quite amazing. We're still doing a lot of research to understand, you know, why it, you know, it, it sort of um, helps us to, by positive thinking and all that, believing things help us with success in what we do. Um, but it makes a huge difference in our learning if we have this growth mindset. Uh, and also I do 
come back to my just now my senior moment earlier, I wanted to say that the fear, right, uh, with uh, emotions with learning. So somebody was asking, uh, because I talked about um, productive failure, making mistakes. So somebody was asking, what if uh, we have this stigma of, uh, am I looking stupid, right? Asking a silly question. Um, well, it's a mindset. <laughs> If you don't think it's a silly question, it will not be a silly question. So I always tell my students, there's no silly question. It's more silly not asking a question, right? So if you have a question, just ask it. It's just that you practice even asking questions. It can be a good question or maybe not a well thought out question. So yeah. if you make a question that's not well thought out and the instructor invites that, it will help you to think through. So the next time you ask a question, it'll be better. Right, so it's it's never there's no stupid question. So it's a mindset <laughs> again, coming back to that. So so hopefully that answers uh, uh, the the audience uh, question on that, um, and also the trust. Just now we talked about collaborative learning. If we are in a trustful environment, we are not afraid of making mistakes, right? We we would try it out, you know. So what if we made a mistake? We learn from it. So that's the positive mindset uh, for learning. Actually, I just want to jump in on prof points here. It's very important. In fact, sometimes when I have to, uh, you know, I do games and other things uh, because I, I like to play, you know, so I give points. I award stupid questions. You know why? Because I think uh, we are no longer in an environment that we should be, hey, the Chinese say paise, paise, uh, means you're afraid to lose face. Actually, uh, if you the more afraid that you lose face, I think uh, you will have set back. It's a disadvantage to yourself. I, I think it's the forming of the questions. If the question is not well formed, get the points. And, and we being the facilitator, uh, we will just kind of massage the uh, point a little bit. And say, ah, do you mean to say you're asking this? And I tell you, they say, yeah, 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 this is what I'm trying to say. You know, And it actually generates a, long, a, a longer, meaningful conversation. So that's, that's actually a very powerful way of learning, actually. In my opinion, it's very powerful at learning, um, rather than showing slides, <laughs> showing all the things uh, that's around. No, people learn when they feel that hmm, I'm corrected, or unlearn to relearn, to unlearn to learn again. I think that's a very important part too. Yeah. Interesting you've mentioned that, Florence, because um, in my centre here, we do one programme and people actually question me. Um, we have this activity called um, Community Kitchen. In Chinese, we call it Da Guo Fan. Um, and they ask me, are you teaching new recipes? Uh, very often they, they ask me, are you getting them to buy new stuff? I say, no. The whole idea of having that session is for um, the residents here to share what they used to do, um, to help them to recap help them to replay what they used to do and share. When they talk about it, when they share about it among themselves, they're learning from one another. So do, without even slides, without um, a classroom uh, base, an activity like this also allows the learners to actually participate. So you'll probably know like the Lego, um, uh, the, the Lego learning style where yeah. you actually give them physical play and they talk about it they will tell you and we can oh i used to cook this way you know but now we can actually use it in this way oh interesting so i used to cook my uh, carrot cake uh in this manner so now i know i can with, with this session i can use machines to cook in this manner so these helps them to actually share information and as well learn from other people in the group and recapping and retelling is like what we say. I think this is one of our theories in, in adult education called COPE, where you have concrete experience, you pack and unpack, and you re-assemble them again. So this is how they actually learn together. So activity learning is a lot more fun um, than theoretical learning for senior learners. They enjoy very much because they find that um, they absorb much better. Mm -hmm. And they, like, they actually like talking in the classroom. They yeah. enjoy, they enjoy the interaction. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, Karen Lin, I'm really happy that you, you shared about the square stepping program. Where we are working with Active SG uh, to, to help them understand how it helps with brain development or changes in neuroplasticity. Uh, we're just waiting for them to open up again for, for the groups to do the uh, square stepping program. Uh, and, and one of the factors you mentioned is the engagement. 
the yeah. social engagement that helps. There's an additional factor from just doing exercise or just doing it alone. Mm. Uh, it's quite different. And they look forward to that, you know, Prof. They, yes. the, the seniors actually, um, and it's not just seniors. I have people in their 50s uh, who don't do better than the 70s. <laughs> so it's, I can conclude yes. that sleep is an issue. <laughs> no, because they're not focused. It does show, show training works. I mean, yeah. um, physical training is also cognitive training. Why yeah. is it cognitive training? Because you have to follow the patterns. You have to remember, you have to execute, and you have to control. Mm. So it's also maintaining that processing speed, but physically. Uh, now, coming back to um, technology and learning, uh, so, so, so called fear of technology with uh, older adults or mature adults, I think one of the things we have to keep in mind from uh, neuropsychology is that we learned earlier the um, fluid intelligence is not as good in older adults. So sometimes it's actually not the fear of technology, but the fear of the pace. It's like, if you learn something on the computer, the young people make it so fast, I don't catch the steps, right? Right. So it's sort of like fear, I'm losing out something. I just don't know how you got, get from here to there. But if we can break it down for older adults uh, to, to know the steps of this technology, it can decrease the fear. So it's, it's more of, and also the older adults understanding is not that they are silly or they're they are not there. It's, it's more of like, it's just their, you know, processing speed is not that fast. Mm. So it's natural for them to not get it. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it's just that as facilitators, we then want to think about the same steps for a younger adult may be quite different for an older adult. We break it down into smaller steps and slow it down a little bit to match their pace, to pick it up. So that will actually help them to reset their mindset uh, Mindset about fear of technology. It's not fear of technology, it's actually not keeping up with the pace of, yeah. of the, you know, the change in the steps. But once we break it down, you, they can get it. Right. It's, it's just like, you know, if you have a MacBook or you have a computer that is still functioning, that processor, uh, at that point of time, when you bought it, it's really good. It's tip-top condition. It's the top of the line. But over the years, that CPU <laughs> will have already become, you know, of a lesser uh, quality. You know, not it, it still functions. It still does its work. But, you know, a 2010 uh, iMac as compared to a 2020 uh, iMac, of course, there would be difference, right? So you, we need to compensate for these differences. Exactly. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, I think we have time for one last question, a quick one around the table. Um, and, and it's related to what we've just discussed, right? Differences in abilities. Um, so far, we have talked about um, learning and mature adults and the differences across age. But what about uh, learning ability and neuroplasticity? How does that apply to people with different cognitive abilities or people with impairments or learning disabilities from uh, we, perhaps you can go with uh, Carolyn first. Um, this is very interesting because um, that this question is being asked. Um, I think Prof can really reiterate this point later, but cognitive maintenance is actually important. Um, and only, it, like I mentioned just now, it's the strengths that you use. If you constantly use it, then you will actually maintain it. But if you don't use it, then it will just... Uh, degenerate over time. It's, it's just like the same as all our body muscles. Example, if you knew how to squat and then over time you give excuses not doing that particular activity, then over time you forget how to squat. Um, I, I just share a personal uh, experience. My, my dad has Parkinson's and he keeps giving excuses he can't do certain things. All right. And it's not that he can't, but he just has this mental block in himself and, and give the excuse, I can't do it because it's like this. I'm not able to continue. But when he is in a good mood, you can see him roaring around. So, you, you know, so I can only say that um, cognitive impairment is really whether we want to move on ourselves. If you want to say that you can't do it, then you will have that fake cognitive impairment. Cognitive impairment comes in really when you actually stop doing what you could do. Right, Prof? 
this, uh, yeah, like what Florin said, mindset. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it sort of uh, encapsulates that. Um, but on the other hand, also, like you think think about different types of disabilities, right? Um, like I, I'm in the the business of psychology, right? <laughs> in terms of how do we help people change behavior or understand the brain and behavior relationships so that people can change their behaviors to to optimize whatever they want to do. Um, the truth is, yes, we can change behavior, but how do we do it? First, we have to understand the profile or like, you know, what is affected in that disability. So just taking a very simple one, like, although aging is not a disability, but just understanding from what I shared about the cognitive profile, we understand that speed um, and all that is, is affected. So we adjust the materials, right? Uh, it depends on what we want to learn. Um, if we want to, to train speed, we can still do it, but that needs a lot of practice and training. Uh, but if we want to make sure that you can remember certain materials, then we can add in different scaffolds, uh, understanding you know, what are the strengths and weaknesses of that individual cognitively and adjust the materials accordingly. So just now I talked about learning um, computer skills or technology. If it's too fast, slow it down. It's not that you can't learn, you can still learn as long as it is you are fitting your, your pace. So for example, like um, you talk about, um, maybe the other, I'm, I'm just thinking about learning disabilities, right? If you have issues with reading materials, uh, then use visual materials to learn the same content. You, you, at the end of the day, you still learn the material. It's just that you learn it a different modality. So all these are considerations. Um, of course, there are limits to neuroplasticity. Uh, it does change. I mean, if you practice enough, there will be some changes, but there are limits uh, where we can't change completely, but we can address it with remediation. So how do we address it with compensation around us in terms of the environment? That's where the learning technologies that what uh, Florence and Carolyn is doing is very important. How do you adjust the environment to help the individual to reach their goal? I just want to also uh, jump in on one point is that, um, you know, setting the environment using tools and the reward system. Somehow, I find that, uh, you know, when you are doing some of these uh, using uh, uh, what you call the games tools, well, it's very fun. Mm -hmm. There are people who will never talk, but suddenly when you bring up this, they yak -yak 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 and yak -yak 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 because they say, hey, this is fun, and they get engaged and they want to win something. But you know, there are a lot of these nice tools and, and they're winning and suddenly it kind of like, hey, you lose your turn. Oh, you know, hey, now you become first when you're last. Ha, ah, you know, this kind of thing. I tell you, I can see all my learners uh, don't care young or old, uh, right? They will just gel in. Why? Mm -hmm. Because I think we are humans. We, we need to be responded, yeah? We need to all play together, that's the word, and, ha and have fun, yeah? So yeah. I thought reward is also something that can uh, encourage. Now, of course, you, I, I don't like punishment, uh, but sometimes, like I said, we all need to be humble to lose some face so that we can uh, take down, you know, take down who we are uh, as in that, that active self, I would say, but relax, be who you are, and learn together. I don't know. I, I find I've been observing that I, as we kind of, as I look at my learners in this aspect, wow. So, Prof, one day your, your studies come about. Right? How, how people even entice to learn because why? They are being recognized in a simple way. Yeah. Actually, Florence, you touched on a very important point the, the reward system. So, I come in from a different level to explain why people uh, find it more um, interesting to learn when you are doing this gamification or, or these activities. Um, one of the things I talked about in uh, the chemical in our brain called um, uh, dopamine, right? And also the reward system in our brain is a very strong system. So we've done studies, the very old studies in rats. <laughs> you know, if you give them electrical stimulation in their reward system in the brain, 
uh, and they can self-administer it and you don't control it, they literally will self-administer until they die <laughs> because the reward system is so strong. But what I'm saying is that if we have these activities that actually increases their dopamine levels, they enjoy it, they're in, put in a good mood, uh, dopamine also increase our attention levels and concentration. So in that way, it sets our brain ready to receive information to learn. So that's why, uh, that's one of the underlying ex explanation of why if a person is uh, in a positive mood or a good mood, they tend to pick up information better than let's say they are depressed or, or you know, not so well uh, sort of prepared. So, but of course we, we are still doing a lot of research to understand what variables, right? What, under what conditions? Uh, would it sometimes be too much? You know, you have too much fun, <laughs> you're not actually learning anything or too little. So that's where we try to optimize. But uh, from a neuros perspective, yeah, we can explain why, um, you know, all those gamification, engagement, uh, increase in their yeah, attention and concentration to learn new things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, optimization is the word, I think, that summarizes up a lot of things that we've discovered, optimizing our mindset for learning, optimizing how we use the technology, optimizing our situation, even though it might be a pandemic, optimizing our, you know, uh, my, our own hardware, our brains through exercise, diet, sleep, and things like that. So today, we've actually heard a lot of uh, very useful areas that we can implement for ourselves and for our learners. And thank you so much, each of you, for the insights and experience that you've brought today. Um, before we close today's session, I'd just like to ask each of you again to share um, three takeaways from, from your, your own parts uh, as a summary for, for our participants here today before we move on to the announcements at the end of the session. Um, let's start with Prof. Annabelle as the first speaker. Could you share the three takeaways again? Okay, so as, as what I've mentioned in my talk, yeah, as we age, Right, we do see changes in the brain, but not everything goes downhill. <laughs> in fact, we are becoming wiser and we are able to make better decisions uh, when we're older. So it's supported by our brain structure. That's one thing, and and the other thing is because of neuroplasticity, we can still uh, learn. We can still make changes in our networks. Okay, so that's very important to remember. And the other thing is that we need to keep a lifelong learning culture so that we can improve our flexibility. So even though our rate of neuroplasticity goes down, we can improve our flexibility to continue to learn and um, preserve our cognitive capacity. So again, we can teach old dogs new tricks. Right. Thanks so much. And um, on to Florence. All right, I think these three statements I have, or three points that key takeaways I have for uh, adult educators out there or L and D's people out there, right? Uh, do remember, knowledge can only become powerful when we can apply it. So there must be some learning transfer. Then you can see that uh, people align and, and stick with knowledge and learning uh, quite well. At the same time, for those uh, that thinking that we can avoid age and tech. Sorry, I, I'm saying I'm so sorry to you to say technology and aging are here to stay. If you choose to ignore it, that's your choice. But I think if you kind of have one step forward with the right mindset, supporting one another in learning, I think it's a hope. Why? Because education and learning has no restriction of age. And, and, and this is the ending part I must say. Living is learning. Learning is living. That's why I hold this tagline very well. I hope I, I learn to the last day before I say goodbye and uh, you know enter into another kingdom. That's all for me. Thank you very much for all your time. I appreciate you staying around. Thank you, Florence. And finally, Caroline? And because of what Florence said, right, that actually uh, when I met Florence few years ago, um, that prompted me to go and do my master's and show other people you're never too late. And I've actually been um, uh, very surprised that in some of um, uh, the mentors around me, I have a 62-year-old who actually finished a master's in gerontology. I have... Um, 
uh, actually two, two mentors who actually finish their master's at 62. So it's never really late to learn. It's whether you want to go and do it or not. Um, most importantly, in, in learning with the seniors, um, I find that more often than not, I'm actually learning from them because I'm learning to be more empathetic, to understand how they have to learn so that I can actually change um, my modalities, the, the, the instruments or the designs that I have to um, make the lessons interesting for them. But most importantly, we need to have the empathy, understand their needs, understand how they want to learn. And then they will enjoy the learning sessions. And this will help them um, in their cognitive abilities as well. It's not just for us, it's also for them. Thank you so much, Caroline. And uh, we are about to call it a day, but before we do, InLab has three things to share with you, uh, the audience. Um, firstly, if you are a training provider or an enterprise with L&D units, this might be relevant. Um, InnoDev is a program that provides a consultancy service to help you transform your trainings and courses into blended learning. And you can submit your interest and see further details in the links on the screen, or you can reach out to the contact person via email. And secondly, InLab is also running a learning interventions, uh, learning innovation intervention study. They are looking to interview volunteers regarding the skill futures. Uh, Skill Future Singapore's intervention relating to the adoption of tech-enabled learning to improve learning. And again, the links and contact emails are on screen. So please reach out if you have any questions. And lastly, your feedback for this session would be greatly appreciated. So please scan the QR code or use the link on the screen or in the chat. And that's it. Um, thanks so much for attending today's InnoVlog session. And we hope that you found today's session insightful and useful. Thank you so much to our panelists again for your expertise and experience. And to our participants, thank you for attending. And to the organizations, thank you to the InLab team for organizing this session. Um, finally, have a fantastic evening ahead. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.